let's go ahead and get this crisis jam started this week. My name is Laura Evans. I am the Director for National State Policy with Vibrant Emotional Health, and I am this week's host. Uh, and we're very excited that the feature presentation today is Dr. Jerry Reed. Um, you know, I don't know if I can give uh, an introduction uh, that will do justice to the legacy and work and impact uh, that Dr. Reed has had on uh, suicide prevention and mental health globally. Uh, but I will note that uh, Dr. Richard McKeon of SAMHSA said that there was no, uh, no one who's had a greater impact on suicide prevention and suicide prevention legislation uh, than Dr. Reed. So I'm very excited um, to uh, have him, we're very excited to have him at the future presentation today uh, and to uh, you know, learn more and hear more as he approaches the new chapter uh, and, and looks forward to retirement. So that will be our feature presentation today. Uh, hopefully everyone uh, will, will get some good uh, pieces of information and we'll have a good discussion. So we'll move on to the next slide. Um, and so last week we had a high mark of 367 uh, individuals participating. And I think this was in part uh, with a crossover event uh, for the Nash Bid annual meeting, uh, but very excited to again, have expanded present uh, participation across the states, uh, across countries, uh, and really do want to ensure that, uh, you know, that this information within the jam gets shared widely. Uh, we encourage participation, particularly from our Medicaid and other payer folks. So just wanna make sure that everyone knows that they are welcome to this meeting. Uh, we have 58 national organizations joining uh, and want to continue to see that number grow. And uh, also our, the crisis talk, the talk.crisisnow.com website. This is your one-stop shop for getting all of the information uh, highlights from previous weeks, sharing the uh, Zoom link so that folks can join without necessarily being on the email list, although you can also sign up for the email, email list there. Uh, you know, we want to have this page be really as uh, informative and helpful for folks as possible. Uh, and so you'll see we try to highlight uh, some of the various segments, including the new trivia hot seat, uh, at least the videos and the quote as well. So this is just really great information, talk.crisisnow.com. Uh, and again, you can see uh, the most recent weeks uh, and then have that link uh, to join the current week right there at the, the top. All right, so our quote for this week, again, uh, we're going back to Dr. Reed uh, and this quote, while our journey is far from over, we are now talking about the preventability of suicide and not the inevitability of suicide. Uh, this is such a pivotal conversation uh, that happened uh, in Nevada, I believe. Uh, and, and this really, I think, set the stage for the national strategy on suicide prevention and, and really shifting uh, and, and changing the narrative that there can't, you know, we can prevent suicide and there's work that can be done, um, you know, to ensure that we are keeping individuals safe. So uh, I thought this was, you know, a great quote uh, given that Dr. Reed is giving our feature presentation. Uh, and this really, you know, kicked off, uh, you know, the journey to where we are now. So just wanted to thank Dr. Reed for that. Welcome. And uh, so for our first presentation, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Stephanie Hepburn, uh, the Crisis Talk editor to discuss uh, this week's article. Hi, Laura, can you hear me? Yes. So this week, so unfortunately, Dr. Sharon Hoover can't be on the call today. So if you have any questions after I give a little brief synopsis of what the article is about, feel free to jump in. Um, so she's the co-director of the National Center for School Mental Health at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. And she shared how school districts across the nation are planning to, you know, they planned rather <laughs> to leave remote learning behind. Um, but in COVID stricken communities, some schools began virtually. So she really gave a great breakdown on what the eight past 18 months have looked like. Often we clump together the impacts of COVID, but it's really fluctuated. And particularly for kids, 
kids are going back to school uh, during a time where there's a more infectious variant that impacts children more. So she talks about the nuances there. Um, and she talks about, um, you know, how there's no need necessarily to reinvent the wheel. The benefit of having been virtual um, is that there are all of these tools that schools can leverage, whether they're in person or whether they're virtual, um, that they can tap into and really help students navigate uh, any sort of mental health challenges. And with this audience, I thought it was, you know, one part that I thought was really interesting. Uh, she talked about a software and it's free. Um, it's called Close Gap. And what it does is it provides daily well being check ins for K to 12 students. So the students can do it at the beginning of the day. And what it does is it provides teachers a dashboard with the students' emotional health for that day. Because we know that, you know, students, their health, you know, their mental health fluctuates. And so it can give early signs of something that might be going on, whether the student needs to talk to the teacher or speak to a counselor. It's like a great pulse check uh, that student that teachers can access and that students can provide um, through this platform. So that's the, the gist of it. Uh, she gives a lot more meat in the article, obviously, of the ebbs and flows of what kids, which, what kids have been facing, but um, that's my little summary and breakdown. But if you have any questions, let me know. Sure. Uh, could you let us know one more time, uh, Stephanie, yeah. what the name of that resource was? So yeah, it's called Close Gap. I actually looked it up because I, I wanna send it to my kid's school. <laughs> um, and I like that it's free and accessible um, and it's called Close Gap, one word. So C-L-O-S-E-G-A-P. And it's for K through 12 students. So it's not just geared towards little ones or older students. Um, it's for that, that entire range, which I like too. Right. Yeah, that, that definitely sounds really fascinating. I know for folks who are parents or caregivers, that's also very important information yeah. to have. Do you know, and I don't want to give too much away from the article, yeah. so let us know if it's in the article, uh, but is there a discussion between um, school districts that may have access to other resources? So if they do need to check in with a student or what happens when, you know, a teacher is concerned about a student's mental health, but there may yeah. not be those connecting services. Right, and she puts a lot of emphasis. You know, we talked about how um, other schools who experience disasters, whether that was mass shootings or natural disasters like Hurricane Katrina, you know, they've already put into place um, these connections. And you're right, during the past 18 months, schools, school districts have had to figure this out. And so what she was saying is that um, school, school, schools have leveraged telehealth. Uh, and, and it's interesting because um, they were, there, she said there's this misconception that those connections weren't happening. Um, and that, yes, of course, it's much easier to identify and do early identification uh, in the classroom. So she's not by any means saying that that's not true. But what she's saying was that interestingly, you know, schools quickly pivoted and were able to tap into leveraging telehealth um, and leveraging these online resources. Not that there wasn't a learning curve. And like, I, I think what you're addressing is that not all school districts look the same. So uh, I think that's a really important point. And that's part of the reason I wanted to talk about closed gap was that, you know, maybe this is something that some dots can be connected for free resources and platforms um, to at least help teachers identify, but you're right, without those other connections, that's that's a big part of the, the puzzle. But uh, for example, in California, I know that they are, um, they put some of their, or they plan to put some of their stimulus dollars um, towards just those connections that you're talking about um, and, and just being actually able to ad identify, uh, but also match students with the resources that they need when they need them. So yeah, that's vital to the conversation. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm very excited to read more of that article and, and learn about what the different states and school districts are doing. And I also want to highlight uh, here in the chat, uh, Debbie uh, has linked to a report, Debbie Plotnick has linked to a report from Mental Health America and uh, Mental Health in Education. So that's some oh, good that's reading. Yeah, particularly as we continue through the school year. Right. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> we're gonna move to the next slide. And 
I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Anita Everett for an update from SAMHSA. Great, thank you. Um, I don't I don't have any particular updates today myself from my position. But, um, I, I do want to um, defer to Richard McKeon. Richard, are you on? Uh, yes, I am. I'll yeah, turn I, over to you. Thank you. Sure. So we are continuing to work closely with Vibrant with numerous federal and non-federal partners. <clears throat> we are about to convene a working group for the Behavioral Health Coordinating Committee that um, we are uh, going to be co-leading with CMS. So we're very grateful about that. We're also paying particular attention right now to coordination between 988 and 911. There are some very good examples of collaborative work that's going on, uh, but we think this is an area that will need uh, continued focus um, in, the, in the lead up to July, 2022 and beyond. So I'll stop there. Great. Well, uh, on behalf of Vibrant Emotional Health, I, you know, I just want to express our gratitude to SAMHSA uh, for all of the work uh, that you all are leading and uh, facilitating the collaboration so that we can get this right between 988 and 911. So thank you. Um, if there are no other updates from SAMHSA, then we can uh, move to Dr. Sims uh, and Megan for an update from Nashville. All righty. Thank you, Laura. And again, wonderful job you're doing there. Uh, just wanted to speak on behalf of NASPA today to talk about, first of all, our excitement with what we've just finished completing. For those of you who are unaware, we had our annual meeting that took place on the 9th, the 10th, the 13th through the 15th of this month. And it was another incredibly positive endeavor where many of the states were involved in a process that really went with the title that NASPIT has been carrying and the missions that NASPIT has been carrying of uh, beyond beds and looking at crisis uh, services, looking at 988 legislation. And it was entitled this particular year, Beyond Beds, Before, During, and After COVID. And it was so relevant because it tied in a number of the topic areas that have been discussed even prior to the development of the COVID pandemic but also has been following through because the going forward, this is also going to contain a lot of the uh, issues that our new Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Abuse, Dr. Rittman, has really uh, put out as her guides and one of the things that she's looking at as far as her missions and values. Now, the annual meeting uh, presented a number of topics, and these topics were presented by those who were involved with a lot of what NASHPA does in terms of development of white papers. And many of these white papers were presented during the time of the conference. And we just wanted to let those know who participated uh, that if you are interested in any of those white papers, we'll be more than happy to supply copies of it to uh, anyone that would like. Uh, and just to keep it brief, lastly, I just wanted to say that I'm very excited, uh, Laura, in a nervous, nervous way uh, to come in, but I'm also honored uh, to be considered to come in to be the moderator for next week's Crisis Jam. Um, I'm going to have to think about this for the remainder of the week for as much as Laura and Vic and everyone else has done their thing as to whether I'm really going to show up next week, but we'll all see if that really <laughs> happens. Uh, but anyway, thank you so much. And Laura, I will turn it back to you. Thank you, Brian. And you know what, you're going to blow us both out the water. So I don't think we'll be invited back. <laughs> uh, Megan, I just wanted to see if there was anything you wanted to add uh, regarding. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And uh, we are really excited that Brian Sims is going to be the moderator uh, next week. Uh, you're just a great leader, Brian. And so delighted for that. One of the uh, pieces of the annual meeting that we were just so very excited about was that this crisis jam was part of our annual meeting and it worked out really well. Um, there were so many state leaders on last week and we hope that, you know, that opens it up so that uh, we have a, a broad audience for this crisis jam. Um, and as Brian said, we can get the paper links and the meeting materials all to the attendees on this crisis jam. So we'll be working on that as well. So just very happy that this crisis jam was part of our annual meeting. Thank you.
Well, Megan, we are so, I, I, I speak for David when I say he's so excited to have uh, that collaboration there with the annual meeting. Uh, I know that the meeting that you all put on was just fantastic. Uh, it was very, you know, again, great information shared, really helpful to hear from the states and what is needed. Uh, and just as we think about 988 implementation, I think, you know, sharing information back and forth through both this crisis jam and annual meetings like yours, you know, hopefully we will get this right. <laughs> but it's really good to have, um, you know, that collaboration and information sharing. And again, look forward to those white papers and, and sharing information widely. Great, thank you. No problem. So this is our second uh, hot seat, crisis trivia hot seat featuring Dr. Richard McKeon from SAMHSA. We are very pleased that it went well last week and that Dr. McKeon has agreed <laughs> to sit again uh, in the hot seat. So this time this is a uh, topic that I thought was interesting and I know David found it interesting as well, uh, particularly from Vibrant's uh, viewpoint around uh, location information and moving with, uh, without changing your cell phone number. So as we know, in today's increasingly mobile society, people are taking their cell phone numbers with them as they move. And so this is a predicament that puts not only uh, access uh, and, and routing, but also a predicament for pollsters as they try to um, kind of uh, drill down into the beliefs. So this is research from Pew. Uh, and so the uh, about every year, 36 million Americans move uh, according to the census, and they often take their cell phone numbers, report them with them. So we want to know the question is how often so Richard, are you ready? So the question is, uh, a person's cell phone uh, area code mismatches where they live, what percentage of the time? So the first uh, question is what percentage uh, mismatch at the region level? So here we're talking, you know, I have a Midwest cell phone number, which I do, even though I live in the American South now. So how often would that mismatch? So either, you know, east versus west coast, south versus midwest, plains versus southwest. Uh, what is your estimate, Richard? Uh, and again, you have two lifelines. You can phone a friend uh, or you can ask the audience, uh, how often do you believe that that is mismatched at the region level? Uh, I'd probably estimate 20%, but I'm going to ask the audience. Okay, he's using a lifeline audience. So if you could uh, put in the chat, your estimate for the uh, percentage of times that a person's cell phone area code does not match the region they currently live. Okay, so we, oh, Richard, this chat, I don't know. We've got 50%, 30%, which I think you said, 28. We have 12, 45, 8, 60. That's a, that's a big one. This is, and this, this, again, is very fascinating research, um, particularly as we talk about crisis services. So I don't think you're going to get a consensus, Richard. We've got 50, 25, 45, 10, 38, uh, 90. Do you want to take an uh, take a, a aggregate of those or <laughs> go with your own? Or you could use your other phone a friend lifeline. I'm going to say 30% based on all of that feedback. Okay, we've got 30% locked in. The correct answer is 5%, which is much lower than I anticipated as well, Richard. I was uh, with you on that 30%, but at the region level, it's approximately 5%. So, um, you know, so that indicates to us that if someone uh, is in the Midwest, they are also kind of moving within the Midwest. So it's not mismatching as frequently as anticipated. Uh, if we drill down to the state level, um, so how often would you imagine that the state, at the state level, a person's uh, area code mismatches? And you still have your phone a friend. We've, we've got 10% in the chat from Paul. Oh, Christy Penn. Christy Penn, you got the... The region level. Oh, great job. We'll have to. That was a great guess. I did not get that. 
think I got, I think I got all of these wrong. <laughs> so Richard, hopefully you have more luck. We've got 7%, 27%, again from, from Christy, she's I'm gonna say 50% on this. 50%, okay. Locked in 50% final answer. The actual is 10%. So 10% of the times, but again, this is according to Pew uh, research from 2016, um, that 10% of the time uh, an individual's uh, cell phone does not match the state. Um, so now if we drill down even more, so we've gone region, state, now we're talking metropolitan area. So a metro area, how often would you guess uh, that the cell phone area, area code does not match the metro uh, area where they live? And again, you still have your phone a friend if there's anyone you'd like to spotlight, Richard. <clears throat> Sorry, I missed that next, the final question there. Uh, how often does it mismatch at the metro area? So um, kind of DC metro area, New York metro area. Uh, we've got 45% in the chat, 10%, 25%. I think I saw Charlie Smith saying 30%, and Charlie's usually right about most things. So I'm going to say 30%. Okay. Now you do have one lifeline if you'd like to phone a friend or spotlight anyone. Well, then I'll reach out to Charlie. Okay, Charlie, if we could spotlight Charlie. <laughs> Well, thank you, Richard. Um, it would be December 9th, yes. To, uh, 9th or 10th? 9th or 10th? It is thank on a Thursday. I'm sorry. Okay. Let me just go back and change. Oh, my God. It just popped up. Uh, if we could just have, uh, if you're not speaking, if you could just mute for us. Thank you. Hi, Laura. It's, uh, it's, it's Charlie Smith, regional administrator out here in Denver for SAMHSA, and, and wonderful to be with you. Richard, I was actually predicting closer to 22% on this one. Um, we, we do know in Colorado, it's roughly 30% though. Okay. So that's, we've got 22 or 30%, uh, Richard, and I will note that there are some caveats. This is research from Pew, uh, not any specific metro area, but just looking more broadly at metro areas generally. Um, so Richard, did you want to stick with the 30 or, or go to the 22? Right, I think Richard may have had to step away for a second. So we're, we'll lock him in at the 30, uh, and Charlie. So let's uh, see what we have here. It's 40%, 40%. So I think that's, 30 is really close. Richard would have won Price is Right. That's good. <laughs> right, he'll, he'll get a chance to spin the wheel later. Uh, so, you know, I think when we talk about location information, you know, I think this is just very important information for, uh, you know, ensuring that individuals are connected to the correct crisis services, uh, the correct lifeline center in their, um, that's actually serving where they are. Uh, we know as people move, and I think I heard during COVID folks moved even more, uh, that, you know, there will be these mismatches. And so to the extent that we can reduce them and ensure that we're connecting people to the right um, services and the right location at the right time is really important. So uh, I thought this was very interesting. Hopefully we will see uh, updated information as folks in the chat are pointing out, this information is from 2016, which seems like a, a lifetime ago. Uh, so hopefully we can see more research on this. And Laura, as just to underscore that, of course, the you know part of the importance for this, I think as you referenced at the start, is that this is very important for the issue of geolocation, um, the routing of 988 calls, and then of course, when there is a life and death emergency and there needs to be, for example, EMS, uh, you know, sense. So um, uh, this has important implications for suicide prevention moving forward. Yes, absolutely. Um, agree with you, Richard. And, um, you know, welcome, uh, if Samson wants to add anything more, 
uh, related to geolocation, I, I see there's some comments in the chat. Um, you know, want to give you the space to do so. Well, I would only mention in terms of geolocation, the FCC under the Hotline Designation Act was required to do a report to the Congress on geolocation that has now been submitted uh, to, uh, to the Congress. Um, and we're waiting to see if the Congress takes additional um, action. Uh, but basically they, they, what the FCC said in their report was that there are really important advantages to geolocation. There's also significant privacy concerns and, and that uh, really important, a, 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 a diverse group of stakeholders from various fields really need to be convened to examine these issues. That was the substance of the FCC's recommendation. Yes. Well, again, thank you, uh, SAMHSA and the FCC uh, for your leadership uh, and Congress on that as well. Uh, we'll make sure to send around a link to that report. But if we move forward to uh, our next slide, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Corcoran, uh, from Guide to give us an update on what is happening with Congress. Thank you, Laura. And I love these questions. So that was very informative, given somebody from the Midwest taking their number to DC. Um, so yesterday, the House released their continuing resolution text that would keep the government funded from October 1st at the beginning of FY22 through the beginning of December, I believe it's December 3rd. Uh, that text did pass out of the House yesterday, and it includes the anomaly request from the Biden administration for the uh, lifeline um, at 78 million above the FY21 level. There's gonna be a bit of a rougher path uh, for it to get passed in the Senate, uh, given that it was paired with debt ceiling uh, provisions, which um, is a little bit more controversial over in the Senate side. So we will keep you posted as we see more there, uh, but the FY21 uh, funding runs out on the 30th. Uh, the 1st of October starts the new fiscal year. So we'll need to see some movement if we wanna keep the government uh, open and funded past then. The reconciliation markups uh, for that $3.5 trillion Democrat uh, human infrastructure package did uh, wrap up in the House last week after several marathon sessions in the health facing sub, uh, committees and subcommittees. Um, that is a bit more TBD on the Senate side. We have not seen any text come from the Senate so far and leadership hopes to wrap it up by the end of October. There's still some outstanding questions, including uh, what the drug provisions, uh, drug pricing provisions will look like, which are responsible for paying for part of the um, package. Everything is supposed to be offset in that package, meaning there will have to be enough savings to pay for the new spending. Um, so that did not get enough support to move forward in the Energy and Commerce Committee, but it did move forward in Ways and Means. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of keep track of, of how those deliberations go between the more progressive and the more moderate Democrat members, as well as the overall funding level that is in question um, based on, again, uh, disagreement in the party, as well as how much they'll have to offset uh, new spending, and then what provisions might be included in this package. There, uh, we saw what came out of the House, haven't seen what the Senate would like to do in that space as well. So it's all up in the air and a lot uh, that has to be worked out before that gets over the finish line. Um, and then I believe we actually have one more slide uh, that will come after this one, if we can switch to that. And then finally, we saw that CMS uh, released on Monday, the announcement for $15 million in plant, state planning grants for that mobile crisis provision of the American Rescue Plan earlier this year. Uh, it went out to 20 states and they, I will uh, copy and paste a link if anybody wants to go and look at the full list of states um, that applied and received the grants. Um, and that is uh, exciting to see a rollout of provisions from the American Rescue Plan that was passed into law earlier this year. That is a lot of activities, Sarah. Uh, yes. <laughs> I do want to see, I know you said there's still some things in flux. Um, with your crystal ball, um, do, are you anticipating a government shutdown? Um, you said they have until the end of the month to 
to pass that continuing resolution funding bill? Yes, oh, I mean, that is difficult. I wish I had a better functioning crystal ball. Um, however, I will say with the debt ceiling provisions being paired with the continuing resolution um, provisions, including the anomaly, but also keeping the government funded at the FY21 level, um, I think there's a number of things that need to be worked out. I did see that there were some emergency funds uh, included in the package to make it a little bit harder for some of the more hesitant members of the Senate to try to vote against. Um, but we've got about eight days to, to figure things out. It did pass out of the House, which is good, uh, but it's a little up in the air. I, you know, it's, I don't think that there's enough support right now for it to actually pass as it is, but with time, more people might cave and vote for it. It's, it's too soon to tell, but it's not looking real great in the Senate right now as of the, where things are now. Okay, well, it looks like they are playing even closer to the edge than we usually do at the crisis jam. Uh, I did want to, I see in the chat that Lee, Leanne uh, from Kentucky uh, did receive, uh, you know, this money for a mobile crisis intervention. Uh, Leanne, I don't know if you're able to uh, unmute yourself and, and just want to give us a quick, um, a quick overview uh, on this money that Kentucky received. Yes, we are very excited here in Kentucky. Um, we're going to, we're of course starting actually today and we are hoping to have a statewide mobile crisis uh, program. So um, we have mo mobile crisis within and crisis intervention services already in our state plan, but we definitely want to beef that up. And, um, you know, especially with the starting of 988 next year to be able to have those resources and services available. Great, perfect. Well, we're very excited to see additional dollars flowing um, to the states to build out uh, crisis services, including global crisis teams. So glad to hear that and congratulations to these states. Um, if we move forward to the next slide, uh, we'll just do a very brief update. Um, it's starting with uh, uh, Hannah uh, Waslowski, and I apologize, Hannah, if I did not get your last name correct, from NAMI, please correct me, <laughs> to give us a state overview. <laughs> Sure. No, you did a, a beautiful job, Laura. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Hannah Wazalowski. I'm Director of Field Advocacy at, um, at NAMI. Angela couldn't join us today, and she asked me to um, step in and give a little bit of an update. Um, I'd say we're in a, an interesting time, right? Most sessions are, are done, um, and but a lot of states are in heavy planning and preparation for 2022 legislative sessions. Several of our national organizations that have either chapters or um, presence and, and activities at the state level have been working on gearing up for 2022 sessions, including talking to our state counterparts to assess what's happening on the ground, what resources um, and tools are needed, and, and uh, really working with state partners to prepare. Um, somebody did ask for an updated version of this chart. I did uh, upload it before uh, in the chat. I can do that again. Um, uh, as, as some of you uh, likely know that um, the California bill unfortunately stalled um, and did not make it through uh, the, the California State Senate before their session adjourned. However, the state did appropriate $20 million for um, uh, crisis services programs and, and, and focused on call center capacity uh, in, in the state budget so that they can start moving forward. Um, I'd also note that our, our advocates in Florida, there's a, a very strong advocacy coalition, have been working closely with the state, um, and a bill is, is starting to get formulated there. Um, some of our Florida folks might be on and could certainly speak to that more, um, but it's great to see effort there. We know that there's lots of conversations happening in other states. Something else I would just note, um, you know, Washington that had a great bill that passed earlier this year, their fees start. Um, to be collected October 1st. So they will be collecting 24 cents uh, on phone bills uh, starting October 1st for their comprehensive crisis system. So I think those are the, the big updates for right now. Uh, happy to answer any questions in the chat. And again, I'll drop that link to the updated map again uh, if folks wanna access that so they don't have to scroll through the chat. Perfect, thank you so much, Hannah. Really important, again, that uh, 
states are generating revenue, uh, you know, happy to see the money allocated for California and the other states, Virginia, Colorado, Nevada, Washington, that do have fees. Uh, and glad to see that the collection is already starting and that will be uh, collected starting October 1st for distribution uh, beginning in 2020. Great, yeah, good to have that. Good to have more money flowing. Uh, so Paul, Absolutely. unfortunately, we do have to skip the five seconds of the, the calculator. I apologize, uh, but want to get over to our featured presentation um, with Dr. Reed. So I'm going to turn it back over to Richard for an intro. Oh, I'm sorry, one more slide. Um, so this is uh, from the Sosose Foundation. Uh, they are leading great work in decriminalizing uh, mental uh, illness, and they have an open call for Pecha Kucha presentations that are due October 7th. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, I think if you have an idea, you put it forward, email betsyfader cw at otsuka-us.com. Uh, feel free to screenshot this slide and it will be uh, on talk.crisisnow.com to access. But, uh, you know, they are leading great work. And, and if you have uh, presentation ideas, would encourage uh, uh, submitting uh, a Pecha Kucha. So if we go to, yep, and so well, now we're at our feature presentation and I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. McKeon for an introduction. Okay, it, uh, I, I couldn't be more pleased to uh, introduce Dr. Jerry Reed, who has been a colleague and friend uh, for many years. There is no one in the United States who is more responsible for moving suicide prevention forward in this nation than Jerry. At every single significant event that has taken place, and Jerry will go over uh, some of these as I understand it, um, over the last quarter century, Jerry has been there, playing a key role, facilitating, encouraging, shaping, and inspiring. His unfailing optimism, good humor, um, and collegiality, and in 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 and, and single-minded focus on the importance of the mission compared to any kind of, uh, you know, private or parochial interest has been um, a, a benefit. So I think that we will all look forward um, to hearing what Jerry has to say. I think it will be a benefit for everyone. And as you sometimes say, Jerry, I would like, just like to say a grateful nation thanks you. Thank you, Richard, very much. And it's really an honor to be here. And wow, what a group and what energy this group brings. And um, it kind of makes me realize um, how many steps have been taken since the moment I realized we hadn't taken a single step. And, and my contribution is really not so much based on my ability, but just the privilege of being in the right spot in the right time and knowing how to do something with it. I'm a social worker, I was trained as a social worker and never missing the opportunity to advance the betterment of an individual or an organization or a community um, is the way we were taught. So the sun, the moon and the stars just aligned as I had this privilege to work in the Senate uh, a while back in 1996, which is where I think the journey began in, in, in real constant and intentional, movement and, and behavior. So the next chart, please, would be a great place to begin. I just believe deeply that anything we do, and this call certainly represents that, will be done better if it can be accomplished with passion. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, passion makes a difference. When you know how to tell a story and you speak from your heart, people listen. And I think that's largely what happened in suicide prevention back in 1996. The human story began to be told and that passion has changed the nation's response to suicide, which I'm awfully grateful to share with you today. Next chart, please. 25 years ago when I started, I was working for Senator Harry Reid as a fellow. I came from the Department of Defense where I was and family advocacy, community support, substance misuse, all the things that went to making um, soldiers and their families 
ready to serve in any capacity they were called upon to do. And I did that for a number of years. In fact, I retired from the federal government with that background. But luckily, at the very end, I was selected to be a congressional fellow. You have to find your own job. And after looking around at 535 members, I settled on Senator Harry Reid, who was gracious enough to give me a chance. And I did so because he was on the aging committee. And that's where the story really begins. My background was aging administration and social work. So I went there hoping I could rekindle my love of aging services because Senator was on the aging committee. One day there was a hearing, it was on mental health and the elderly. And so I called the state of Nevada. I did my background research and prepared the Senator for his testimony that day, learning that suicide was the number one mental health challenge facing older adults in the state of Nevada. On that day, Mike Wallace was a witness, the famed journalist from 60 Minutes, and he shared his own battle with mental illness at the time. And when he did, Senator Reid took the microphone and said, Mr. Wallace, if you're brave enough to tell the American people about your battle with clinical depression, I should be brave enough to tell the American people that my pop shot himself. And Senator Reid revealed that day that he himself was a lost survivor, having lost his own dad many years earlier to suicide. And he said, let's do something about it, because nothing had been done about suicide nationally in the public policy realm. So at that time, suicide was viewed as a private matter, not something to be talked about boldly. Evidence was sparse. There was little clinical training, although we knew that our clinical workforce was woefully unprepared to treat people who had suicidal ideation or presented with suicide, but we just weren't investing in the training that needed to be invested in. There was little capacity, very little infrastructure. And when I looked at the slides today, just in previous to my presentation, was blown away with the infrastructure that now exists. And we should all not take that for granted. That was part of a plan and it happened. And now it's time to capitalize on that investment. We were not talking about suicide. Every word spoken in the US Senate or the House of Representatives is captured in the congressional record. When I looked at the congressional record and typed in suicide prevention or crisis services, nothing showed up in 1996. Look at where we are today because we started in earnest talking about this very preventable public health challenge and not as Laura, Laura said, the inevitability of this public health challenge. And there was no funding virtually for suicide prevention. Next chart, please. So there began the journey. People heard Senator Reid tell his story, survivors all over the country, and they said, will you become a champion? So he did, he was willing to be the champion. He called for, um, the uh, Senate resolution, Senate resolution 84, um, that basically just said suicide is a national problem. It warrants a national solution and we need a national strategy for suicide prevention. And that language and that, that request really came from the document you see there on the chart called the prevention of suicide, where it basically said that if the nation wants to address the public health burden of suicide, it really needs two things. One, it needs a national strategy for suicide prevention, a roadmap of what needs to be done. And two, it needs a coordinating body, better than, bigger than any one agency, bigger than any one sector that can mobilize and muster all of us to do what has to be done to advance the objectives of that national strategy should it come to fruition. Well, lo and behold, the day it was introduced, it passed unanimously. So now suicide was in the national public policy space with a foundation. Shortly thereafter, a large meeting, about 300 plus people was held in Reno, Nevada, sponsored by CDC, SPAN USA at the time, which is now a component of our great colleagues, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and the Surgeon General. And people said, what do we know about suicide? What do we not know about suicide? And what can we do to advance this issue in our nation? Lo and behold, the Surgeon General produced the purple document you see there, which is the call to action, which really mobilized the nation. And at the same time, 
advocates and loss survivors and attempt survivors and just allies were creating quilts. Every state in the nation created a quilt and put a face on that quilt from someone in that state who'd been lost to suicide. Senator Reid himself put his father's face on the Nevada quilt. Senator Gordon Smith himself put his son Garrett on the Oregon quilt. And these quilts were used to humanize the, 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 the issue of suicide in a way that said, we've lost far too many and the contributions they would have made will not be made because we're not making the kind of investment in discovery and practice and, and application that we need to. And then I won't go through all of these, but you can see there was mobility, there was momentum. And shortly thereafter, we issued the first national strategy for suicide prevention in 2001, which was an incredibly powerful document that kind of gave us that roadmap. And it was like 10 years later in 2010, when we were finally successful and convincing then administrator Pam Hyde from SAMHSA to work with her colleagues in the Department of Defense and the Department of Health and Human Services to create the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention. So what I'm sharing with you is that the two pillars that were absolutely called for, the creation of a national strategy and the creation of an advisory body or a coordinating body to oversee our national effort was now in place. So the public sector, the private sector, the faith community, the media community, all saw their role in suicide prevention. Next chart, please. I think what we learned at the very beginning, and I remember when Senator Reid introduced Senate Resolution 84, there were three organizations that wrote a letter of support, and they're in the congressional record. It was the American Association of Suicidology, it was the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and it was NAMI. Those three letters of support, coupled with the resolution that Senator Reid on the Senate side and Representative John Lewis, the late John Lewis, on the House side introduced, both of which passed. And I think what we learned is when we fly in formation, when we speak with one voice, when we're not competing with each other, talking to our elected representatives, we win so much more because we're unified and the member of Congress or his or her colleagues can see this is not going to be contentious. This is what the nation needs to do. The, the federal sector, the private sector, the nonprofit sector, and the constituency sector are all calling for the same thing, which gave us the power. Next chart, please. You've all seen the, rib, the river story, I hope. It's the public health story. I won't read it word for word, but the bottom line is we learned that suicide is not just a mental health issue or a serious mental health issue. It has consequences certainly downstream when people are most at risk and we need to save those people with the infrastructure and the systems we have, but we have to think upstream about why people are becoming at risk or why populations are becoming at risk in suicide. So again, our strategy emphasizes very clearly it's downstream, midstream, and upstream that is all essential if we're gonna effectively reduce suicide in our nation and stop people from falling in the river and at the same time, pull those out who are at the river's edge who need to be saved now. Next chart, please. These are the strategies. The 2001 strategy was released. It guided us for, you know, basically 11 years. And then in 2012, I had the privilege of writing the National Strategy for Suicide Prevention with our then Surgeon General, Dr. Regina Benjamin, and a wonderful group of people to include Richard McKeon and others who just help us get it right. And, and I must say, we have followed that. You now see crisis services being discussed in, in real authenticity and intentionality. You now see zero suicide being discussed, the transformation of healthcare systems. We're seeing many of the things that were captured in those 13 goals actually seeing the light of day and becoming the practice of the nation, which is phenomenal. Next chart, please. Basically, the three priorities that I think we're focusing on is transforming healthcare systems, which is what we're doing through national zero suicide efforts, transforming communities, because we know, as Dr. Satcher said in 2001, suicide prevention happens in communities, 
And I think the entire crisis now movement is all about transforming communities and making sure they have the infrastructure to respond as people are in the river who need to be pulled out and supported far before they become at river's edge, um, calling for support, but even upstream when they need support that first time and the connection to services that crisis now and the crisis movement would, would deliver. Um, also changing the conversation. We shouldn't talk about just the tragedy, the crisis, the loss. We should really make sure that we talk about the preventability of suicide, the hope in that preventability, and the help and support that comes with that preventability and the focus therein. Next chart, please. The accomplishments are many. If you could just click a little bit. Um, you're going to see several things that the Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention, people like David Covington and Mike Hogan and Richard McKeon and Anita Everett and countless others have contributed to. If you'll keep clicking, you'll see that there are now national research agenda. There are national workforce guidelines in place. There's a document about how survivor support should be provided. You can see the suicide care and systems framework, which was a product of the Alliance that led to goal eight and nine in the national strategy, which calls for zero suicide. And you can see many, many others to include, how do we communicate? You know, how do we help um, uh, people with grief, trauma and distress after a suicide? So collectively we've achieved far more than we would have achieved alone and independently. Next chart, please. So today, I think the lesson learned is we need multiple coordinated interventions. No one intervention alone will do the job. We need to transform systems. We need a sound crisis response. How sad that people in a community need help and can't get help unless they're lucky enough to call that one site or that second site that's able to provide them the support they need. We need to sustain these efforts with reliable and deliberate funding that doesn't go away when the grant goes away. We need to focus on upstream and downstream and mental health and public health both apply. Next chart, please. As you can see, when the veteran Christ line was being formed, there was a desire to create a separate VA hotline, but through the good work of others and the privilege I had to talk with folks at VA and the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee, we were able to encourage the Senate when they passed the Joshua Omvig Veteran Support Act to utilize the already existing national hotline and just create an option one service. So we don't have to put out multiple numbers that will confuse people, but we can connect them to reliable systems that they can get them the help they deserve. Those are the kinds of privileges that the seat I sat in afforded me, and I was just so lucky to be able to take advantage of them. Next chart, please. Together, we can do so much. These are all of us that are little in size, but when we put ourselves together, we're bigger than the shark that confronts us. So I'm a social worker, I'm an advocate. I, I just don't ever doubt the power of one and how the power of one can become the power of many. And we have changed the way America looks at suicide prevention and we are changing how it looks at crisis now. Next chart, please. All right, I'm just gonna stop real quick and just say that, you know, one of my favorite stories and I'm gonna read it very quickly is about the bamboo um, trip. And I'll just basically state it, that a man planted bamboo seeds and went back year after year, watered, tilled and fertilized, never saw any growth with his bamboo. But luckily um, one day he went back after five years and the bamboo had grown 800 feet in 30 days. So when we least expect the growth to occur, it occurs. And I'm confident in my lifetime that when someone's in crisis, they will get the help they need because of the work of every one of you on this call and countless others. So let me thank you as I get ready to retire for carrying the flag, continuing the journey and not stopping till we get to the destination. Thank you very much, Laura, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Jerry. Really appreciate that uh, presentation. And, you know, th throughout there were some things that really struck me, you know, the power of one, you know, we are, and I'll echo Richard here, so grateful for the work that you have done and you have led 
um, you know, we would not be where we are today without you shepherding um, through this process. And so I also looked at your accomplishment slide. Um, and I think there was a um, accomplishment that was not on that slide. I don't know how you could put it on the slide, but it is the faces of the individuals who have been helped. Yeah. Um, and that is such an accomplishment, such a legacy. Um, and I, I, I see the echoes of appreciation and gratitude in the comments. Um, so I'm going to bring in uh, Dr. Hepburn and Dr. McKeon uh, for their thoughts um, on the presentation. Yeah, hi. Uh, uh, let me make sure that Richard gets the last word. So let me uh, say a few words uh, about Jerry. Uh, this was a great review, Jerry. Uh, thank you, a review of the movement and also your outstanding recommendations for us to work together. I think it's a good reminder that we can do a lot more uh, working together rather than competing with each other. So thank you for that. And uh, today, to, in my mind, this is a nice opportunity to celebrate your career. Uh, as Richard opened with, you've been a, a true friend. And as Laura uh, emphasized, you've been a, a true friend. And it, it goes further than your career. It really is, as you talked about, um, giving of yourself and that comes through and uh, we appreciate it. Uh, you've been a nationally recognized leader. Uh, you've emphasized suicide prevention, raised the awareness of suicide, uh, driven public policy. You've been a really outstanding role model. Uh, you've been an outspoken advocate of the importance of public health as well as mental health in the approach to suicide prevention. You've been a good friend to the states, to the local jurisdictions, even though a lot of what you said uh, was applicable to the national level, you have really reached out uh, to other levels and made yourself available and uh, uh, passed on those, those parts of you that were so important to making changes within the states and local jurisdiction. You've been a good friend. Uh, we're going to miss you, but we're also excited to see what you're going to do next. Uh, so thank you, Jerry, for your long career and for your re reminder that uh, hope and prevention should be emphasized and let's not just get down in the negative. So thank you and best wishes. Okay, so um, I'll just add a couple of, of comments to what I said earlier in introducing, uh, you know, Jerry, um, you know, as you approach this milestone of your retirement, but I'm confident that in your transition that you will still be available to the field to provide guidance and wisdom. You know, David Covington has this uh, saying that he really likes to use, and I think it really applies to you, which is, uh, I think, it, gentle pressure relentlessly applied. And I think that's what you've done for the past quarter century. And part of what one sees is that at times when we become frustrated or pessimistic about change, the history of suicide prevention in the United States tells a story, just as you said, about what can be accomplished. When a story can be told about the, what needs to be done and what can be done, and the persistence of sticking with it and building on the foundation and having patience, but continuing to gently apply that pressure which is what you've done for the past you know, 25 years. And personally, it's been an honor to have walked a good part of that road with you. So thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Brian. What a, what a great testimony, and you're both friends. And yes, we will stay in touch. As long as I have something to contribute, I'll do my best to be there. Thanks a million. And, and I will echo Richard, Jerry, you know, we would love to have continued presentations and uh, uh, feedback here on the jam. You know, we want you, there's still more that you have to contribute. I don't doubt that that is ending. So we will uh, again, see you next week on the jam. Uh, next week, uh, as mentioned, Dr. Brian Sims from Nashville will be hosting. We will be having 
uh, Amy Cohen uh, from SMI Advisor uh, as our feature presentation. So we are very much looking forward to uh, seeing you all next week. Thank you so much for all that you do and uh, good luck everyone. <laughs>